are they saying, the leaders of Google, Facebook, Yahoo? I mean, are you talking to them? Well, uh, I, I tried to. I, you know, I, t I had a brief conversation with Larry Page in which he said, well, I don't think this is a very interesting problem, and that was about that. But uh, y you know, uh, further you know, f further down in, in Google, uh, th there are a bunch of people who are wrestling with this. I think the challenge is. I talked to one Facebook engineer who sort of summed it up quite well, and he said, "Look." What we love doing is sitting around and coming up with new, clever ways of getting people to spend more minutes on Facebook, and we're very good at that. And this is a much more complicated thing that you're asking us to do, where you're asking us to think about sort of our social responsibility, our civic responsibility, what kind of information is important. This is a much you know, more complicated problem. We just want to do the easy stuff. And you know, I think that's, the, that's what's sort of led us to this current place. I think. There are also people who see the flip side of that and say, this is one of the big, juicy problems in front of us, is how do we actually take the best of sort of 20th century editorial values and import them into these new systems that are, that are deciding what people see and what people don't see. Talk about how much money is being made off of this. And I mean, just this neutral term of personalization. <laughs> right. Uh, it sounds so benign. In fact, it sounds um, attractive. It sounds great. It's yeah. geared and tailored for you. What could be better? Right. And, and it does rely on the sense of a, a sort of cozy, familiar world online where your favorite website greets you and goes, oh, hey, Eli, we've, we've teed up all of these articles for you. Welcome. Uh, it, it feels very good. But uh, you know what's driving this is, uh, you know, in, in some ways this is the uh, driving struggle on the internet right now between all of these different companies to uh, accumulate the biggest amounts of data on each of us. And uh, Facebook has its strategy, which is basically ask people to tell. Facebook about themselves. Google has its strategy, which is to watch your clicks. Microsoft and Yahoo have their strategies. And all of this feeds into a database, which can then be used to do three things. It can target ads better, so you get better targeted ads, which honestly, I think, you know, sometimes is fine uh, if, the, if you know that it's happening. It can target content, which I think is much more problematic, that you start to get content that just reflects what it thinks you want to see. And then the third thing is, and it can make decisions about you. So one of the sort of more surprising findings in the book was that banks are beginning to look at people's Facebook friends and their credit ratings in order to decide to whom to give to offer credit. And this is based on this, the, this uh, fact that you know if you look at uh, the credit ratings of people, you can make predictions about the credit ratings of their friends. It's very creepy, though, because it, you know, really what you're saying then is that it would be better not to be Facebook friends with people who have lower credit ratings. That's not really the, the kind of society that we want to be building, particularly. Well, even more frightening, obviously, is once all of this uh, information, personal information, is gathered, it saves uh, the government uh, and its ability to surveil its population a lot, of tr a lot of work. Because basically, the private companies can gather the information, and all the government has to do is issue the subpoena or make the call uh, that for national security, we need this information. Uh, so in essence, uh, it doesn't have to do the actual surveillance. It just has to be able to use it when it needs to. There's a, a funny uh, Onion article that, that has the headline, CIA rolls out very successful new Facebook program, uh, implying that the CIA started Facebook to, you know, to, to gather data. And uh, it's funny, but there is you know, sort of some truth there, which is that uh, uh, you know, these companies do have these massive databases, and the protections that we have for our data that live on these servers are far, uh, you know, far less protection than if it's on your home computer. Uh, the, the FBI needs to do much less paperwork in order to ask Google for your data than it does to, you know, come into your home and, and look at your computer. And so increasingly, so, so this is sort of the downside of cloud computing is that it's, it allows more and more of, of our data and everything that we do to be available to the government. and. You know, to to for, for their purposes in a democracy, but it's in an authoritarian state as well. That's um, right. I mean, it's it's a, it's a natural byproduct of consolidating so much of what we do online in a few big companies that really don't have a whole lot of accountability. Uh, you know, that, that that aren't being pushed very hard by governments to do this right or do it responsibly. 
uh, you know, it'll naturally lead to, to abuses. Um, Google Inc. announced yesterday that um, they have launched uh, a bid to dominate a world in which the smartphone replaces the wallet as the container <laughs> for credit cards, coupons, and receipts. The mobile app is called Google Wallet. How does this fit into this picture? Well, it's just another, I mean, the way that Google thinks is, how can we design uh, products that people will use that allow us to accumulate even more data about them? So obviously, once you start to have a sense of everything that people are buying flowing through Google's servers, then you know you have way more data on which to uh, target ads and target content and do this kind of personalization. You know exactly how to slice and dice uh, people. And again, you know in some contexts, that's that's fine. Actually, I, I don't mind. Uh, you know when I go on Amazon and it recommends books, they're obviously not very good recommendations sometimes, but it's fine. But when it's happening invisibly and when it's shaping not just what you buy but what you know about the world, I think it, you know, it's more of a problem. And if this is going to be sort of the way that the future of the Internet looks, then we need to make sure that it's much more transparent when this is happening uh, you know, so that we know when things are being targeted to us. And we have to make sure that, that we have some control as consumers over this, that it's not just uh, in the hands of these big companies that have very different interests. So you have a powerful force, Eli Harris. <laughs> so you are the head of MoveOn.org. Now you are, what, the chair of the uh, board, the board yeah. of MoveOn.org. So um, this MoveOn has um, millions of people. It reaches all over the country. What will Move On do about this? Well, you know, there's sort of this dance here because basically Move On takes on the issues that uh, its members, you know, want to, to take up. So I, I've been very careful. You know, I don't want to sort of impose by fiat that I wrote a book and here's, you know, here's now we're going to campaign about this. But, uh, you know, there are campaigns that we're starting to, to look at. One of them, I think, that's very simple but actually would go a significant way uh, is just to. Uh, you know, have a basic have a way of signaling on Facebook that something is important, even if it is, it's not likable. Obviously, this is sort of just one small piece. But actually, if you did have an important button, you would start having a lot of different information propagating across Facebook. You'd have people exposed to things that maybe aren't as you know smile inducing, but we really need to know. And uh, Facebook's actually considering adding some, some, some new verbs. So this could be a winnable thing. Uh, it, it's not, it, it won't solve the whole problem, but it would start to indicate, it would start to remind these companies that there are ways that they can start to build in you know, some more kind of civic values into what they're doing. In any sense that in Congress, uh, any of the politicians are paying attention to some of these issues? Or understand this? Yeah, there are a few that, that have been really uh, attentive to this. Al Franken, in particular, has been very good on these uh, data and privacy issues uh, and really pushing forward. It's obviously challenging because a lot of the Democratic congressmen and women uh, are get a lot of money from these companies. Silicon Valley, you know, certainly the Obama administration and Obama got a lot of uh, support from Silicon Valley. So th they don't totally want to uh, get on the wrong side of, of these companies. And they feel like the companies are on the side of good and on the side of sort of pushing the world in the direction that they wanted to. Uh, it, it means that we don't have as good congressional watchdogs as you would hope. But there are a few uh, good ones, and, and Franken in particular has been great on this. Well, Eli Pariser, I want to thank you for your work and for writing The Filter Bubble, uh, What the Internet is Hiding from You, board president and former executive director of MoveOn.org, which at 5 million members is one of the largest citizens' organizations in American politics. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, back in a